Good evening. Good evening. Thanks very much. Uh, welcome to the third annual Olmstead Lecture. Uh, we really appreciate the, the turnout tonight. It, it means a lot to, to us. My name is Doug Crowder. I have the honor and privilege of being the chairman of the Olmstead Foundation. Uh, many of you are, are familiar uh, with it. If not, I'm going to just give you a quick history lesson. The Olmstead Foundation was was founded by a gentleman by the name of George Olmsted, funny enough, who was a 1922 graduate of uh, that reform school on, on the Hudson. Um, um, uh, class of 22. His older brother, Gerald uh, Olmsted, went to prep school and then went to the Naval Academy. And he graduated also in the class of 22. Uh, General Olmsted was the first captain of cadets, and Gerald was the brigade commander at West Point, I mean, at uh, the Naval Academy, <laughs> which is pretty incredible. The Olmsted Scholar Program has been here since uh, 1960, was our first class. So this spring we'll pick the 59th class of Olmsted Scholars. To date, 634 scholars have gone to 218 uh, foreign universities in 60 countries and 44 different languages. Uh, and uh, the experience is very slim similar for, for all of them. General Olmsted's deep belief was that the greatest leaders much, must be broadly educated. And that's what his program is really all about. One of our what are the expectations for these young scholars? And oh, by the way, I'm going to introduce some of these scholars uh, before I turn this over to, to General Scott. But what we ask these scholars to do is, is to be fluent in a foreign language, to, when they go to the country that they're going to, uh, have a deep cultural immersion uh, with their families, live, live in the community, not on base, not part of the embassy, but uh, really just be a student like, like every other student, and if possible, get a, get a graduate degree at that university. Now, the graduate degree is not in the foreign language, meaning they're not getting a degree in French or German or Russian. They're getting a degree in, in the humanities for the most part, e economics, politics, international relations, and that sort of stuff. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty tough climb to, to, to be able to learn a language and then quickly do graduate level uh, work. And, and it, uh, it is a real stretch uh, for these folks. What we're trying to build with these scholars is not uh, foreign area uh, officers. We want them to come back and be uh, operational uh, right away. And, and matriculate up the ranks and, 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 and go to high command. Uh, for example, uh, perhaps a commander of a COCOM like our speaker tonight, General Avisade was, or another Olmsted scholar, the current commander of Southcom, Kurt Tidd, uh, is an Olmsted scholar. Uh, Bud McFarlane, is Bud here? Said he was gonna come, okay. Bud McFarlane, as Olmsted Scholar, was a national security advisor. Uh, and that's what we're building. We're not building area specialists or, or FAOs. We're building folks who have got, who've had an opportunity to, to live in a foreign country as uh, almost a local and really understand what makes them tick, what makes them think, what they think about the United States. And it really changes them uh, when they come back. Often when I talk about the program, I, I, I mention that it's not only an educational program, but it's a leadership program. And I gave an interview uh, last year, uh, and I said that to, the, to my interviewer, and he said, wait a minute, wait a minute what, what's the, what do you mean leadership? I go, yeah, leadership. I and mean, we give these young scholars just enough language training that they won't starve, but not enough that they'll be comfortable. And then we parachute them into the country they're going to, and they had to figure it out. How to get an apartment, how to do everything, and that they're on their own. So I left this interview, it's videotaped. Uh, two days later, I get a call at home uh, from a young lady, sit on the video 
production editor, I have a couple questions for you before I put this out. I said, fine, what are your questions? She says, well, you said you'd give them enough language training such that they won't starve, but not enough, you know, that they'll be comfortable. How much is that? And I said, well, it depends on the language. You know, it's Russian, Chinese, Japanese, probably a year or a plus of language training. If it's French, German, uh, Italian, around six months, seven months for the language training. She said, okay, I got it. How long is the parachute training? <laughs> I, I almost said six weeks, <laughs> but I thought I'd get out there and we'd be sued or something or, or lose all our applicants. So uh, I was only kidding about the parachute. We, we buy them an airline ticket and, and they'll, they'll do fine. I'd like uh, now to introduce uh, members of the board of directors of the Olmstead Foundation who are here, first of all. If you'll stand, uh, directors of the, of the foundation. Uh, Bob McClure, uh, Colonel, uh, U.S. Army, retired, recently uh, retired again from the Association of Graduates at West Point. Uh, uh, Captain Select, so Dave Sove, who is on uh, uh, Senator Sessions' staff as a fellow, uh, is our Navy Active Duty Director, uh, and uh, Bruce Scott, who is the CEO and President, uh, you're going to be talking to soon. Did I miss anyone? Okay, thanks. Now I'd like to ask uh, all Olmstead scholars who are less than 50 years old, <laughs> I'm looking at the front row here, to please stand up. Now, our, for our VIP guests, uh, a lot of these, a lot of these folks are uh, are still doing language training, getting ready to to head over to to a lot of different countries. If you get a chance, you know, during the reception afterwards, to to grab them and ask them about the program, I I think it'll be uh, useful to you. Thanks. Uh, tonight we have a special guest with us, um, and that's Rear Admiral Linda Fagan, uh, United States Coast Guard. Linda, will you, uh, Linda is the Deputy Commandant at Coast Guard Headquarters for Operations, Policy, and Capabilities, and she is the Commandant's representative tonight uh, here. And Linda, I would like you if you would, to hand deliver this letter to the Commandant. And I'm gonna read part of it, if you don't mind. To the Commandant of the Coast Guard, I am pleased to inform you that on 18 October 2016, the Olmstead Foundation Board of Directors voted unanimously to approve your request that the United States Coast Guard join the Olmstead Scholar Program. I could not be happier. There is little doubt that the Olmstead Scholar Program will only be enhanced by United States Coast Guard participation. Olmstead Foundation President Major General Bruce Scott, United States uh, Army retired, will be our point of contact for officially accepting U.S. Coast Guard into the Olmstead Scholar Program. I ask that you appoint a pon uh, point of contact to work with General Scott. I am thrilled that the United States Coast Guard will be joining the Olmstead Scholar Program as we head into our 59th year of this wonderful program. I know that our program will be even better because the United States Coast Guard is now an integral part. Signed, Doug Crowder, Chairman of the Board. Okay, with that, let me just, uh, uh, one more announcement, uh, 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 Bruce Scott is going to introduce our guest speaker, General John Abizade, and then after uh, General Abizade's comments, uh, we'll have a Q&A session, and after that, those doors will open up and there will be heavy poo-poos for all of us. <laughs> Thank you.
I like following another short speaker, I really do. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all the VIPs who are with us tonight. There's one special VIP I want to individually recognize. It, John had the good sense to bring his lovely wife, Kathy. Thank you, sir, very much. I also wanted to stress what a joint program we are. And if you notice, both the chair, uh, chairman of the board and I are wearing purple ties. I have a purple shirt on. You know how hard it is to find both of those, okay, especially a bow tie? Well, it's my distinct privilege in honoring and introducing our guest speaker tonight. About 2,500 years ago, the ancient Athenian Greek scholar, warrior, General Thucydides, he's most famous for having written a book called The History of the Peloponnesian Wars, an eight-volume tome. He's credited with the following remark. A society that has demarcation between its scholars and its warriors will have its thinking done by cowards and its fighting done by fools. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest speaker tonight is the antithesis of Th Thucydides' warning. I've known General John Avisade for over 40 years. John's grandparents immigrated from Lebanon. They moved to a small little town called Colville, California. John was raised in a loving family, primarily by his father, as John's mother died of cancer when he was young. I should note here that John's father was a, <coughs> excuse me, a machinist mate, a Navy machinist mate in World War II. John worked hard in high school, studied hard, and got an appointment to attend the United States Military Academy. Admiral Crowder was confused with the name. The United States Military Academy <laughs> at West Point. John graduated in 1973 and did what all great West Pointers want to do, infantry, airborne ranger, and go off to scenic, scenic Fort Bragg, and serve in the 82nd Airborne Division. Well, about four years in, I learned that John had applied for and accepted an Olmstead scholarship. And I looked it up and I said, my God, John's gonna have to learn Arabic and he's gonna go study in Amman, Jordan. I said, what is he thinking? We've got 260,000 soldiers in Europe ready to fight off the Russian horde that's where you've got to be focused. There's not a chance in hell we'll ever be fighting a ground war in the Middle East, okay? <laughs> that may explain why I'm a retired Major General, okay? <laughs> so John and Kathy learned Arabic. They go to Amman, Jordan. John not only studies hard, he goes culturally around the area, he meets with uh, Middle Eastern military leaders, up and coming, promising middle, military leaders, does a great job on the Olmsted Scholar Program. The Army, Army selects him to go to Harvard, where he gets a master's in, for, in, of arts in Middle Eastern study. Now, he's been away from troops for a while. It would be easy to kind of stay on that path, but John's a warrior. He demanded to get back right in with the infantry, and they gave him the creme de la creme of all infantry assignments. A line company, A Company, John? A Company, 1st Ranger Battalion, Hunter Liggett, Georgia. Now this is where this part of the introduction gets exciting. 33 years ago today, 33 years ago today, John and his band of brothers, fully combat loaded, mounted up into C-130s, strapped themselves in the web seats, and went on the most miserable six and a half hour, half hour plane ride you could possibly imagine to a tiny little island in the southern Caribbean called Grenada. The plan was for the C-130s to do a rapid landing, combat assault out, seize the international airport at Port Salinas, but in route, they found the Cuban construction workers and the mercenaries had parked construction equipment in the middle of the runway. So they changed their plan in flight. Coming in at 500 feet at 5.15 in the morning, John's Ranger Company, Alpha Company, and Bravo Company jumped into that airfield. They immediately established a perimeter. They couldn't seize the airfield 
Because at the end of the airfield, there was a machine gun, a heavy weapons embankment with Cubans bringing fire on them. Now, these are light infantry guys. They just jumped out of an airplane. So John, the Olmsted scholar, the innovative thinker, he sees, well, the Cubans left a bulldozer in the middle of the runway. So John grabs an, one of his rangers, probably John, I'm assuming it was a combat engineer, ranger, and says, go figure out how to jumpstart that bulldozer. Well, soldiers can jumpstart anything, OK? <laughs> they jumpstart the bulldozer. Caterpillar D9 cranks up, blade is raised, and for the first time, in American history, an infantry attack was led by a bulldozer. <laughs> they neutralized that machine gun position. Now, this was a legendary story in the Army, and no one would know about it until Clint Eastwood made a movie called Heartbreak Ridge, where he plays a gunny sergeant who orders a Marine to take the bulldozer. Now, I don't know how John's Rangers morphed into Marines for the movie, but they did, okay? And I tell you, John's adventure was a lot better than that movie was, but that's an aside. After that experience in Grenada, John commanded every elite combat formation the US Army has. He commanded an airborne battalion in Vicenza, Italy. He was a brigade commander in the 82nd Airborne. He was the assistant division commander of Old Ironsides, 1st Armored Division, and ultimately division commander of the Big Red One, the 1st Infantry Division. But John, as I told you, is a scholar warrior. He was also executive officer the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He was an uh, uh, Army fellow at Hoover Institute in Stanford University in California. John was also the J-5 on the Joint Staff. He served an operational tour as an UN observer in, the, in Lebanon and ultimately became the J-5, the senior strategic advisor to the chairman and the president. But John's culminating assignment in 2003 when he was appointed commanding general of COCOM. Can you imagine how did this happen? We have a general officer, fluent in Arabic, who by the time when he takes command, all of his young buddies that he met in Amman are now leading their military, and he's overseeing two ground wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. John is a soldier warrior. <clears throat> This is what we want all of our Olmsted scholars to aspire to be. We want soldier, war, uh, scholar warriors who are forged in fire, tempered by knowledge, so they have the courage to fight for their beliefs and the knowledge to know what beliefs are worth fighting for. Ladies and gentlemen, John Emmesy. Bruce, Bruce, I have five minutes left. <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. Thank you very much. Congratulations to the Coast Guard. We're delighted that you're now part of the team. If I'd been on the board, I'm not sure which way I would have voted. <laughs> no, uh, the Coast Guard's a great service. We're delighted to have you. Get that out of here, Bruce. Thank you. Give it to a Navy guy. George Olmsted, West Point, class of 1922, as a matter of fact, was the last West Pointer to see Army win an Army-Navy football game. <laughs> right, Bob? Is that true? <laughs> and we intend to change that this year. If the Cubs can do it, anybody can do it. Um, all of you Olmsted scholars, everybody here in uniform, all the friends of the Olmsted program, thank you very much for being here. Uh, Kathy and I are delighted to be here. We uh, love this program. It's one of the world's greatest program, and the incredible talent that comes out of people that have been out there and done what we want Olmsted scholars to do is something that you need to pay attention to. And, those of you that are leading your services, and many of you are in that position today, uh, think about hiring an Olmsted scholar. It doesn't matter whether they speak Russian or Chinese or Arabic or whatever the case may be, they will be a good member of your team. Why? Because they know the world and they're not afraid of it. 
And when I look around today, and I'm not going to talk politics, no politics tonight. Geopolitics I'll talk, but no politics tonight. When I look around the world today, there's too many Americans that are afraid of the world out there. And we need to go out there, we need to be part of it, we need to help solve its problems. And when we help solve their problems, we help solve our own. Kathy and I went to a high school of 110 people in the mountains of California, up Colville, Bridgeport, some of you may know it. Anybody know Nevada at all? It's near Nevada. Not Nevada, but Nevada. It's, uh, it's a great place. When it came time to retire, we said, okay, uh, let's go home. You know, we've had a lot of fun, let's go home. But people in Washington, they can't understand. Why in the world would anybody want to go back to Nevada to retire up in the Sierra Nevadas? And I'd tell them it's beautiful, we grew up there, et cetera, et cetera. And after a while, I get tired, answered the question. So I finally say, hey, look, it just reminded me a lot of the Afghanistan-Pakistan border area. <laughs> Everybody hates the federal government. They're all heavily armed. There's a certain amount of drugs going back and forth across the border. <laughs> and most importantly, when you're a retired general, you can lead a militia. <laughs> so, you know, uh, my last assignment, of course, was commander of CENTCOM, and we love being out there. Um, I saw Jim Mattis about four years after I'd retired. He was a CENTCOM commander. I said, Jim, I don't get it. The Middle East was in pretty good shape when I was in charge of it. <laughs> and if I were to see the current commander, I might say the same thing to him. Uh, but look, I'm not here to, uh, to joke with you. I'm here to talk about the serious subject. I want to talk about stability in the Middle East. I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the observations I had from running around out in the Ukraine here recently. And I am, am now the senior US appointed advisor to the Ukrainian Minister of Defense. I'm delighted to do that. I will have to learn how to speak a few words of Ukrainian. Um, I was out in the, uh, what they call the anti-terrorist operation in the Donbass down near around Luhansk and uh, um, that area down there in the southeast corner. I was out in the west watching American troops, training Ukrainian troops, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about that. When I was, one of the last things, one of the great opportunities I had as a CENTCOM commander is I had 25 different countries in my area. And one day, Secretary Rumsfeld, and you've all heard that, you know, he never talked to us generals, but I talked to him a lot. He called me up and he said, hey, General Abzig, I'm looking at the map. You got 25 countries, but I'm looking at the map, but you don't have Syria and Lebanon. And I want your opinion. You also heard stories he didn't ask us our opinion. Not true. And I always gave him my opinion. I said, uh, well, what is it, sir? He said, well, uh, I notice you don't have Syria and Lebanon, and I'd like you to put them in your area. But before I do that, I want your opinion about that. I said, sir, we've got a war in Iraq, got a war in Afghanistan, smuggling off the coast of Somalia, terrorism in every one of these countries, all sorts of problems everywhere else. So all things being equal, I don't want it. He said, well, thank you for your opinion. Do you have them? And I said, well, Mr. Secretary, could you please give me North Korea and Haiti then? <laughs> he was not amused by that comment. <laughs> but nevertheless, I stayed for three more years. So look, what uh, I want to do is talk for you know, 10 or 15 minutes and then have a dialogue with you because it's a rare opportunity to have the leaders of the services, the joint staff, and so many Olmstead scholars in a room like this and I would love to have the opportunity to talk about some of the problems that we see out there. But first I want to talk to you about the Middle East in particular. Stability in the Middle East. When are we going to find it? How are we going to find it? Are we going to find it? I mean, we've been fighting now for 16 years. It's actually less stable today than it was when we started fighting. And the problems endemic in the region are problems that we need to pay attention to. I think we need to acknowledge the fact that the old post-European imposed post-World War I order has broken down. It was an artificial construct at the time and it survived for a long time, but it's not surviving now. The boundaries 
are absolutely nothing compared to what the various sects and organizations and people are doing out there. It is an area where restoring the status quo, which I may be so bold to assume might be our policy in the Middle East, will not work. Restoring the status quo in the Middle East makes no more sense than trying to restore the status quo in Yugoslavia many years ago. When things break so badly, it's time for fresh thinking. It's time to come up with a better solution. And it has to be done in a way where we can combine not only our diplomatic skills, but our military skills because of the difficult situation that we find ourselves. The Middle East is full of conflict zones. It has been for thousands of years. It's got religious turmoil, sectarian tensions, authoritarianism prevents governments from being able to move forward, and extremism is endemic. And we've been fighting it for a long time. You look at Mosul today and you think of Raqqa tomorrow and you hear politicians and unfortunately some generals say, we are just about to wrap it up over there. But we're not anywhere close to wrapping it up over there because the problems are so deep and so dramatic that it will require more than American military power, it will require international military and diplomatic power to put it all together again. When I look at the Middle East and I think about my time as a CENTCOM commander, so much of it was about trying to reconcile Sunnis who had been dispossessed. And when I look at the track record from the time I left to where we are today, we have still not found the solution to Sunni reconciliation, and until we do, there won't be any peace in the Middle East. We've got to address the Sunni problem as a matter of urgency. If we do not, we will have what I call the fourth wave of extremism on our hand. The first wave, we could actually start with about 10 ways if you want to be completely honest about it. But let's say the first wave was bin Laden and the attacks on 9-11 and all of the ensuing conflict. Then the second wave was Zarqawi, Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Then the third wave is the current wave, ISIS, where they have global ambitions, they've seized territory. But when I think of the ideology that they represent, and I think of the way that they're fighting, and I think of what has happened with the first, second, and third wave, I'm pretty much of the opinion that after we take Mosul and after we take Raqqa, there's liable to be a fourth wave. And I'm not quite sure I know where it will be, but I'm pretty sure that it will be out there, and we will have to face it and we'll have to be tough about it. But we have to think differently about it. We have to give the good people in the region an opportunity to have a better future. And so far, we've been able to find those solutions. Stability can only come through Sunni reconciliation. I said it before, I say it again. The road to accountable government is a road that the international community has to get on. It has to force unaccountable governments, which is almost everyone in the Middle East, to be more accountable. Let's just be accountable before we're democratic. Let's be accountable to our people. Let's give our people a better chance for the future. We have to use international military and diplomatic action to prevent ISIS from gaining and holding territory and whatever comes after ISIS from doing the same thing. We have to be able to move in a synchronized and coordinated fashion with the international community in a way that we haven't found yet. We've got to untangle the Syrian mess. How much messier can it get? The Russians are there. The Assad government is there. Lebanese Hezbollah is there. Iran is there. Various Sunni militias are there, some of which are friendly to us, some of which we have trained, that we hope are friendly to us. Our Russian friends are 
bringing in combat power and influencing the situation in a way that is unimaginable a few years ago. The Turks are there. We could go on and on. But when you look at the battle space, when you think about the things that we soldiers have to worry about, this compressed battle space, and you think about the next stage of the campaign, can we realistically say that there's a way to untangle it by putting up a no-fly zone, by somehow or other striking targets that are so intermeshed and un untangleable uh, that it's very unlikely that we can hit what we're really aiming at? We have to have diplomacy, and we must consider fresh thinking in the region to include the redrawing of boundaries. We've got to do it. The old Middle East offers us some clues to how it could be. We can't just say no. Like we finally came to the point in Bosnia and we've come to the place in other places around the, the world, we've got to think about redrawing the boundaries. Perhaps they're federal within a construct of a nation state. But I can't imagine Sunnis, Kurds, and Shias coming together in a way that's going to be prosperous from Iraq for Iraq in the foreseeable future. Perhaps a federal structure can work. Perhaps it won't work. And if it doesn't work, we need to think about the national boundaries changing. Armed peace enforcement might be part of the solution. But whatever we do, we have to walk away from sectarianism. We have to quit reinforcing sectarianism and stand for a secular order to emerge in the Middle East. Otherwise, we will be doomed to face the ISIS fourth wave, the ISIS fifth wave, and the Al-Qaeda sixth wave. Secularism is the only path for Middle Easterners out of the morass. It doesn't mean that they need to abandon their religion. It simply means that they need to find a better way forward that can allow for peace and prosperity to their children and their grandchildren in the years ahead. Diplomatic international action is necessary. International conferences can work. Just because we don't talk to each other in our own politics doesn't mean that we can't talk to one another internationally. We can talk to the Russians, we can talk to the Turks, we can talk to other people and we can use our military forces wherever ISIS shows up again, whether it's in the Maghreb, whether it's in Africa or Southeast Asia, and use those military forces to raid and attack while at the same time using diplomatic tools to move an agenda forward that allows the Middle East to find some semblance of normalcy. What I suggest is not something we're doing, but it's something I think that we ought to do. So recently, in addition to the many unstable countries that I saved in the Middle East, I've been asked to save the Ukraine. <laughs> and I presume I'll probably be about as successful. <laughs> but the Russians are an interesting bunch, and I sometimes think that it's disconnected but I know that it is completely connected. And when I think about something happening in Syria, US aircraft versus Russian aircraft versus Syrian aircraft versus Turkish aircraft, and we have a problem where we shoot down a Russian aircraft or God forbid they shoot down one of ours, that things around the periphery of Russia start to move in a bad direction because all things are connected. Putin has a thermostat in Georgia that he can turn up and turn down. He's got a thermostat in Ukraine where I just came back from where he can turn it up and he can turn it down. He has a future thermostat in the Baltics and all of these things from the Baltics through the Ukraine down to Georgia over to Syria are all interconnected and require the international community not to ignore and isolate Russia, but to talk to Russia and at the same time show strength. 
shows strength to the Ukrainians who want to be independent, shows strength to them to allow them to defend themselves. I understand why Russia is so insistent about the Ukraine staying out of the NATO alliance, but I also understand that we all live on the principle of nations being able to chart their own path, and the Ukrainians are trying to do that. It is imperative that with the next administration that we review the rules of how we can help the Ukrainians, not to confront Russia, but to give Ukraine a chance to live in peace. After all, they're a 44 million person country in the middle of Eurasia, and they need to have the opportunity to allow their people who want to be free to be free. So I'm just back from the front lines. Very interesting trip out there. I will tell you about it over a drink. But what did I find? I mean, sometimes I used to sit back and read some of the dispatches from the United States Army and think, well, they're paying too much attention to what's going on out there. But the truth of the matter is they're not paying enough attention. What I see out there as a professional soldier tells me that we really have to pay attention to this environment. GPS spoofing by the Russians. We see EW on a level I have never seen in my military career. We see drones flying and when we have used some of our own drones to try to help out in a very non-lethal way, uh, we found them to be wanting. Cyber activity is at an all-time high. And all of this is linked to very capable artillery. And this is not even talking about the special forces and Spetsnaz that are embedded in to the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republic's separatist forces. So we need to go to school on what's happening there. We need to understand that the past 16 years of warfare while forging a warrior class is not enough for the next 16 years that may be ahead. We have to know how to use all of our weapon systems in a way that can bring American firepower to bear in the most non-permissive of environments. I think sometimes when I'm at the, out at the National Training Center, and recently I was in Hohenfels watching our troops train there, what would they do they being the guys that I'm gals that I love so much that serve our great nation, what would we do if we turned their GPS off? What would they do if we took their radios away? What do you think the Russians and the Chinese are doing? They're trying to go to school on how to take away our cyber capabilities, our EW capabilities, our drone capabilities, our space capabilities, because they think that that is our Achilles tendon. So we gotta pay attention. So despite all the things I've told you tonight, I am intensely optimistic about the way ahead because we have well-trained armed forces, we have incredible diplomats, we have a new administration coming and I don't know and I don't care who it is, but I know they're gonna have to review policies and move forward in a way that is different. And that way is essential for us as we move ahead. We must find an opportunity for Sunnis in the Middle East to be more prosperous, to be more capable, to turn away from extremism. We must confront Russia, yet at the same time, not drive them into the corner. Military tools alone will not work. Diplomatic plus military plus economic plus intelligence are the tools that all of us know will work if we can just coordinate them and synchronize them. I am enormously confident about the quality of people in our armed forces and in our government. They can literally do anything, and we have asked them to do things that no other country on earth has ever asked their civil servants and military people to do, and time and time again, our people top the mark. But somehow or other, we've got to help them more. We've got to get behind them with all the elements of our national power, and we must embrace the international community in a way that makes sense. 
And one of the ways we could do it is think about hiring some Olmstead scholars. Bring them onto your team. Use them because they know what they're doing, they're not afraid of the world, and they're capable of making things happen. This is whether you're a military person or a civilian person, the Olmstead Scholarship prepares people. Kathy and I went to Jordan. We learned how to speak modern standard Arabic. At least I learned how to speak modern standard Arabic. Kathy and I almost got divorced when we were in class 48 hours a day together. <laughs> so once we, once we got, avoided that bullet, we were good. But then, you know, I went to the University of Jordan. At first I went to the embassy and they said, oh, hey, we don't recognize the Olmstead Scholarship, sorry. We have nothing we can do to help you. Later they did. Uh, I rented an apartment, Kathy called it the Fuhrer Bunker. <laughs> then I went to the University of Jordan and I started talking to the administration people and I used modern standard Arabic and it was like going up and say, how art thou, you know? <laughs> Where for art my beautiful wife? <laughs> you know, those sorts of things. And what I learned from all that is we can do anything when we send people out into the middle of nowhere and tell them to get something done. But we can't do it if the bureaucracy stands in the way. We can't have the embassies saying, no, we won't take Olmstead scholars. We can't have the State Department saying, no, we don't need you here, it's not safe. Not safe? How many more places do we need to go that's not safe? Going to places that aren't safe today will make us safer tomorrow. And that's what the Olmstead Scholar Program will do for you. So ladies and gentlemen, I've said about as much as I can possibly say. And I hope uh, we have an opportunity for some great questions um, until Bruce tells me to shut up. Thank you very much. All right, no question too difficult. Remember, I've testified before the Senate. <laughs> and you will have to stay here for the answer. <laughs> well, thank you for your comments. I, I have a question. So after the war in Germany, we stayed. We stayed in Italy. We stayed in Japan. We stayed in Korea. Should we stay in Iraq and Afghanistan? Should our footprint there look like our footprint in some of the other countries that we've aided over the years? You know, that's a wonderful question, and should we stay or not stay, and can we stay in the matter of um, what we did in Germany, what we did in Japan, what we did with Korea, et cetera? You know, in Germany and Japan, we all, they were ultimately defeated. I mean, they were not just defeated a little bit, they were devastated and they surrender. We sometimes think that war is all about liberating people and going after bad guys, but the truth of the matter is it's much more complicated than that. And once you make the decision to cross the border, uh, you have to think beyond getting rid of Saddam Hussein or Bashar al-Assad or any other dictatorial person that uh, we have decided to villainize because it's really about can we make the region stable for the good people that are in the region in a way that makes sense for them? And can we do it with a low intensity footprint? When, by that I don't mean hundreds of thousands of troops. I mean enough to make a difference. And I'm, I'm not convinced that uh, uh, huge numbers of troops ever made good sense in the Middle East. It didn't work for the Romans. It didn't work for the British, and it didn't work for us. But the right number of troops, which I think we're starting to move towards, over a long period of time, and a willingness to use our air power, sometimes sparingly, sometimes not, and to use our forces, and by this I just don't mean special forces, uh, is an important thing for us to be willing to do. And I believe that the notion of a special forces only army is the wrong notion. You have to have a full portfolio of naval power, air power, ground power, 
uh, that you're able to use to deal with whatever situation may confront, it, you, confront you, but then you have to join it up with diplomacy and the international community. Um, so are we gonna spend more time in the Middle East? Yes, but you know one of the things I have to admit has been a huge change in my lifetime is the fact that we are not completely dependent on Middle Eastern oil the way that we were. Our allies are, but we're not, and that creates a geostrategic opportunity for us that we haven't had in a long time and we should take advantage of. So less walk away completely, no, uh, but consider changing boundaries to give Sunnis an opportunity for some sort of a federal state, especially in the area uh, that encompasses Mosul and out into the um, eastern provinces of Syria in particular, we need to consider that. Yes, sir. Yes, Bob. Go Army. You still remember those words, right? Even though you're... Yeah, thanks. Yeah, but ask Joe Anderson or Billy Melville here to, you know, tell me what in the world's going on out there today with regard, you know, to day-to-day -day stuff. I, I just know what I read in the newspapers. Um, Turkish forces in the middle of this operating in a, in a way that uh, is not countenanced by the Iraqis and the Syrians and others is a dangerous sort of thing. Um, back in 2004 or five, I was briefing NATO. And in my briefing, or I was talking about all the things that I thought were going on in the Middle East, and I said, we got a long war on our hands, and everybody said, oh no, you know, don't use those two words, long and war, we don't like that. Here we are 16 years later, right? And I, I said, I misspoke and I said something about the Islamic, uh, the Turkish Islamic Republic. And the ambassador came out and he came up and he said, I gotta correct you. We are not an Islamic Republic. We're a secular Republic. And I, you know, I'm not gonna correct you in front of everybody, but I want you to make sure you don't do that again because that is not us. I think if I were to make that same statement today that the ambassador would say, thank you very much. And, and this doesn't mean that it is an extremist state, but it is not the Ataturk Republic that we have seen. And it's a state where it's difficult to know what Erdogan is trying to do. Um, on the one hand, if you recall a while back, he went after the secular people based on information provided by the Gulenists, and now he is going after the Gulenists um, because he thinks that they've become too powerful within the body politic of the state. The military has been eviscerated in a way that I don't think we've seen since Stalin-type purges in Russia. Although he's not killing them, he is putting them in jail. I mean, the Russians back in those days did not spare anybody. Um, but it, it's dangerous for NATO, and it is worrisome for NATO. But on the other hand, we can't live without Turkey. It plays this essential role of a state in NATO that is essential for the defense of NATO. It's essential for the southern flank. It's essential for peace in the Middle East. And what we have to do is work hard with the Erdogan government, which does not want to be isolated, which sometimes says extreme things, but on the other hand, when you look at their actions, they are explicable. And I think that we need to continue to reach out, especially the United States, continue to reach out to the Turks. They still want to be part of Europe more than they want to be part of the Middle East. Uh, but history is an interesting thing. 
as much as things change, they go back to the way they used to be. And Turkish role in Central Asia and the Middle East is not to be denied. They can be the great bridge between NATO and the Middle East and Central Asia, uh, but it requires a lot more patience on our part to keep them on the team. Great question, Bob. Thank you. Yes, sir. Well, thanks very much for uh, speaking to us tonight. Uh, my name is Chris Ensley. I'm a Coast Guard sailor, and I appreciated your comments regarding cybersecurity in Russia. And I just wanted to ask, with a nation state that has utilized cyber tools, relatively inexpensive cyber tools, to affect, in some ways, the democratic processes here in America, how should we as a country respond? You talked about using a whole-of-government approach, but how specifically, what tools should we look to to respond to, to what Russia has been doing? You know, Kathy and I, the other day, we were in our, our homestead there in Nevada, staring at the jackrabbits and watching the tumbleweeds go by. And all of a sudden, <laughs> just about all of our stuff stopped working. I think it was on Friday. And there's a big denial of service attack going on. I, the whole reason I moved to Nevada is so I didn't get a denial of service attack. <laughs> Matter of fact, I was hoping not to get any service. <laughs> But are we, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know the classified things that are going on in the cyber world, but the cyber world has yet to be properly organized and governed. Every other aspect of the international community of this more and more globalizing planet of ours has become somewhat governed in some fashion, either by international agencies or by like-minded countries finding a way to govern the highway, the airways, whatever you might think it is. And it's hugely important for us to start to govern the cyberspace before something happens that takes people's lives, which is inevitable if we keep doing what we're doing. And by we, I mean the Russians in particular, the Chinese. When I look at, at our future, you know, we're going to have a long-term problem in the Middle East. We're going to have long-term issues with the Russian as a near-peer competitor. And of course, we haven't even talked about China tonight, but we know that there will be growing competition with China, if not tension, over places like the South China Sea and other places, it's inevitable that great powers will have friction, but it's not inevitable that we need to have war. But if we don't start to govern the internet space in a way that is agreeable to nations, I, I think we're going to have more and more trouble. We need to separate the criminals that are out there, which are many, from the nation states that are working and moving in that area. And when the nation states hire criminals and use criminals, we've got to figure out a way to, to move forward either in a retaliatory fashion or move forward in a way that allows us to be able to say that our cyberspace is as safe as our airspace. Come on, Olmsted scholars. Yes, sir, Air Force. Does Air Force have a football team? Yeah, Thank yeah. You. Thank God. So you started off talking about um, uh, Sunni reconciliation. And uh, I know this uh, driven in part, at least, by a very um, active Iran. And wanted to know what your thoughts were on um, the recent nuclear deal and what you think we should do uh, about Iran and its ambitions in the region. So when we think of Iran, we think of Iran as a Shia extremist state, as a unified Shia extremist state. Yet when you look at the polling that comes out of sensitive and unsensitive places, you find out that the place the United States is the most popular in the Middle East is in Iran. When you think of Iran, you think of people that urged Hezbollah to attack our Marines about 
same amount of time as ago as we were in Grenada. And you think about them pushing the Israelis out of the Lebanese buffer zone in southern Lebanon. Um, you think about them now sponsoring all sorts of training activity and actual military activity on the Syrian battlefronts. You think about them in Iraq attacking our own troops. But you also have to think of Iran as, as one of the great civilizations of the world with a very educated population, with an opportunity to break out of this extreme state that has temporary control. And the extreme state of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Quds Force, of the mullahs, that's not the state that will survive. And if it is our strategy to gain time, we need to gain time with the Iranians. And talking to them should not be ever out of the equation. It should be part of the equation. I can remember as a young officer in the Soviet Union days, we were always prepared to go across the East German border if necessary, or in my earliest days, have them come across the border. And uh, at the same time, we were never afraid to talk to them. We talked to them because we had to. We have to talk to the Iranians. And we have to find ways to encourage moderation within Iran because moderation matters in Iran. Islam in Iran is different than Islam in Saudi Arabia. The place of women in Iranian society is su surprisingly strong. There's opportunities to work with Iran, to bring Iran out of isolation, but at the same time, like anything else, we have to be strong enough that when they move out of the reasonable realm of what nation states do, we have to be able to confront them. And we can't afford for Iran to become a nuclear state. We really can't afford for North Korea to be a nuclear state, but they are. We can't let the world continue to nuclearize at a point in time when we have tensions with the Russians and tensions with the North Koreans and potential tensions with the Chinese. Our worst nightmare is that we return to the bad old days when we lived under the umbrella of, of uh, nuclear weapons. I think, unfortunately, we're coming closer to that than we may want, and we're going to have to pay attention to that. But we should not exclude the Iranians from the opportunity to be part of a solution to a better Middle East. They have their own view. The mullahs want to expand. They want to cause the Shia extremist ideology of theirs to spread. But I'm telling you, it is a spent force. And if we stand up to them and we act wisely and we use military force wisely, we partner with the right people in the region and we provide a path for Sunni reconciliation, it's my opinion that Iranian power will be rolled back. Good question. Yes, sir. My name's Christian Deegan. I'm a son of Michael Deegan, Olmsted scholar, studied in Heidelberg, Germany. Um, I'm interested in your experiences in uh, Ukraine. In 1998, George Kennan in the New York Times said that he was worried that Eastern expansion of NATO might prove to be a tragic mistake and might lead to a new Cold War. Um, certainly, in Russia today, we see an illiberal bent in leadership and uh, paranoia and possible. Um, imperial ambitions, uh, might it not, though, be unwise to risk exacerbating um, any latent Russian paranoia? And while the West sh should be very interested in the self-determination of uh, countries, governments in Ukraine and Georgia, um, at, at a certain point, shouldn't NATO uh, close membership in cases where membership might run counter to the, to the alliance's purposes? I mean, it's typical to come to uh, an Olmsted Scholar opportunity like this and all the great people that are associated with it and, and have questions that are so complicated I just should not answer them. <laughs> but I'm going to answer it because I'm retired and I can. Um, I, I've been so perplexed about how to move forward with Russia on better terms. We don't want conflict with Russia. 
Um, I don't really believe the Russians want conflict with us, but their aggressiveness is actually more than I've seen in a long time. A European state to move into other European states with armed forces is uh, a very, very bad sign. And if you're uncharitable, you think back to the days of Hitler with his last territorial demand in Europe. Uh, but I don't think it's quite that bad. I do think that we have to pay attention to what the Russians have told us about the expansion of NATO. Is it possible that someday the Ukrainians become a NATO member? Yes. Is it likely in the near term? No. Is it a point of enough friction with the Russians that they might occupy all of Ukraine or at least part of Ukraine to the Dnieper River? Possibly. I, I have the opportunity through the Belfer Center at Harvard and Kevin Ryan, who's not an Olmsted scholar, but who is a great Russian speaker and former attache in Moscow. And we meet with retired Russian general officers and uh, ex people that were in their intelligence services. And there's a certain amount of members on their side, certain members on our side. And we can never meet in Russia or the United States because both teams have somebody that's persona non grata from the other, <laughs> other country. But we do go to nice places. And uh, we were in Serbia recently. The Russians like that. We were in Morocco. I like that. You know, I mean, it's pretty good. But in each year that I've gone to these meetings, the Russians have become shriller and shriller and shriller. And their message has become very, very clear. You moved too far east. You said you weren't, and you have. They started out the last meeting with everyone on the Russian delegation side saying, Spasiba, you know, thank you. And they say, and you know, we're sitting there saying, what is this all about? And, and so then this, the, the key guy says, we're thanking you because you've made us so much stronger with the sanctions. We would rather eat grass than succumb to your sanctions. And, and you know, the, the, the dialogue is bad. The body language is bad. The sense of being back in the old days when we were staring across at the Eighth Guards Army is central in my thinking when I see him anymore. But at the same time, you know, life is potentially better for Russians if they join the rest of us in a way that is good for their own people. You know, this authoritarianism, cronyism, corruption, these are not just problems for Russia, they're also problems for Ukraine. And so, you know, do I know that we won't go to war with the Russians? I suspect we will not, but I think it requires not that we bring NATO to the borders of Russia through the Ukraine, but that we help the Ukraine become too hard for Russia to digest. And let's let the Ukrainians figure out their path ahead as an independent country. In many respects, by, by going into Crimea, people there, in my opinion, it's only my opinion, they weren't too ready to go to war with the Russians over that. But when they came into Donetsk and Luhansk, Everything trained, changed. And, you know, I, I was out there on the, on the boundaries and in the, in the line of contact, and the, some of the units I visited were Russian-speaking battalions that were Ukrainian. And they're determined to fight. They're fighting well. Uh, they're determined to fight for a long time. And so these are people, in my estimation, that want to be free. They deserve uh, to set their own path. It may not be under a NATO umbrella, but it can be with the help of the international community. And so um, I respect the Russians' paranoia about our movement east. But on the other hand, I do not respect what they are doing to an independent country, whether it's the Ukraine or Georgia or Syria or potentially the Baltics. And I've reminded my Russian friends time and time again at these meetings that Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania are NATO members. And if you think we won't fight, then you've got us misjudged as well. So it's, 
You know, Putin is playing chess. He's not just thinking about grabbing land. He's thinking if he puts enough pressure on the alliance, that the alliance will show weakness and that the alliance is fragile. And when the alliance is out of the way, Russian can, Russia can be all that it needs to be, in his view. So I think I need to be all that I need to be and quit talking because Bruce has stood up to give me the hook. I'm going to let the chairman say the final remarks. I'm positive we could keep John here until 2 in the morning. But as the president of the foundation, who paid for an incredible amount of food out in the other room, <laughs> I want to make certain you all have an opportunity to eat it and also visit with John who, and Kathy, who are saying. Mr. Chairman? Hey, before the chairman says something, I just want to say one final thing. For those of you that are in uniform and those of you that have been in uniform, those of you that have served the country in the civilian world, thank you for what you've done. This country is the greatest country on earth. And if we're not out in the middle of it trying to make it better, then we are not doing our duty. Our duty is to defend our country, but the best way we defend our country is by being forward, by being strong, by being ready, and by not paying too much attention to politics. <laughs> Thank you very much. John, on behalf of the Olmstead Foundation, thank you so much for this great evening of enlightenment. And, uh, and now, if you'll join us for some cheer uh, next door. And, and again, thank you for all of our guests who took the time to come tonight. I hope you found that useful and you learned a little bit more about our program and uh, maybe start making a list of who these guys and gals are to, you know, to get on your staff at the right place. And again, thank you so much for the United States Coast Guard, the fifth armed service to join the Olmsted Scholar Program.